If you're thinking about buying the Canon RF 100 to 500 millimeter lens, or upgrading from the uh, Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary lens, or even just buying the Sigma outright, then I think this video may be of some help to you. I'm looking at this lens uh, from a perspective of an amateur hobbyist wildlife photographer. So I'm gonna do an unboxing, and then I'm gonna go out for a real field test where I'm looking at uh, seeing how its weight compares, um, its overall ease of use, um, its autofocus speed, autofocus accuracy, determine whether there's any pulsing in that, um, and then compare some uh, sample images side by side taken with the Sigma. This isn't gonna be a um, technical or pixel peaking review where I take static pictures of test charts and then look at distortion, vignetting, pincushioning, etc. Uh, there's lots of other reviews out there done by people who are far more qualified and more capable than I. Um, I do recommend though that you do also have a look at those reviews um, at the end of this video. I personally often watch uh, Christopher Frost and Justin Abbott when making lens choices and yes I do think that the uh, technical things that they cover will make a difference um, in your in your real world, real world photography. So I've just bought the Canon RF 100 to 500 millimeter lens, paid it for out of my own money um, and here it is still in its box. Um, I haven't even opened this box yet, so uh, we'll do that together in a moment. Um, but first, I just want to explain why I've chosen to buy this lens uh, when I'm already the owner of a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary. Um, the reason is that I want a lens that's faster for focusing, uh, sharper in terms of focus to increase my keeper rate, uh, weather sealed, and ideally a little lighter too. So, Will this new, or new to me, RF 100 to 500 millimeter lens give me all that? Well, um, let's find out, shall we? But just before I do get into the unboxing, um, let's deal with the elephant in the room, which is, can you use the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter contemporary lens on a mirrorless body for Canon and get fantastically sharp photographs from it? Well, in simple terms, yeah, absolutely, 100%, yes you can. I've got absolutely no regrets about buying this lens uh, whatsoever. Um, when I first bought it, I had a Canon 77D entry-level DSLR, um, which I'm actually still using to this day to film my YouTube videos, including uh, this, this video right now. Um, and I've since used it adapted to the Canon R6 on a mirrorless body, and I've had great results with both. Um, on occasion as well, uh, I will even use it on a older Canon 5D Mark I, the original 5D Mark I from 2005, and again, still getting great results. That said, Times have changed, things have moved on, and this Sigma lens here uh, was originally developed as a DSLR lens for the Canon EF mounts, and it's done a reasonable job adapting um, to the Canon RF system, but it was never designed for that, um, and with Canon not allowing third-party manufacturers to make RF lenses at the time of making this video at least, I'm kind of stuck with either upgrading within the current Canon system, or I'm also seriously considering uh, the idea of leaving uh, Canon perhaps going to somewhere like Sony where I can have access to third party lenses. Uh, it's a shame because I really do like the Canon camera bodies. I think the focusing is fantastic. The ergonomics are great. I'm very happy with the image quality, but it's that lack of availability for third party lenses for someone like me who's very much a hobbyist, who just can't afford those big 600 millimeter and 800 millimeter professional grade lenses where effectively we need to remortgage our homes to buy one. Um, yes, I know there are cheaper alternatives out there, from Canon like the um, RF600 and RF800, uh, both at f11, um, but with a small focusing area and the fact that they don't let in much light, as you know I like photographing owls, they, they tend to come out in low light, I don't think those lenses are going to give me what I need. Anyway, I digress, so um, back to the RF100 to 500mm, um, let's see what we've got inside this box, shall we? So here's the box then, um, I'm having to make some awkward angles here to uh, unbox this because I am stood right behind the camera at the moment with a, a soft box to the right hand side and I've got, got to kind of walk and work around this to unbox so some funny angles coming up here. I do have a pair of scissors just in case we do need to cut something though. I wouldn't normally, I'd just use keys or rip the box open but in this instance, try to do a bit more, well <laughs> in this instance rather, I'm trying to be a bit more professional. So right, let's open up the box. 
um, smartly packaged. The first thing you'll notice actually is that there's no seal on this box just here. Um, and I was a bit concerned, um, so I went and checked the other um, Canon stuff that I bought from John Lewis, for example, the R6 box, which I've kept. And there was no seal on that either, so I presume it's quite normal. If it's not, and you think it should have a seal, then by all means do let me know. Um, I did check with the retailer that I purchased this from. This is not grey stock, it is UK uh, stock. One of the reasons why I wanted uh, UK stock, and I know you pay a lot more money for it, is because um, I'm the sort of guy that does drop things. I've already had to send my Sigma lens off for repair. The Canon 77D body that's filming this now has also been sent off for repair twice. So uh, yeah, I, want, I don't want anyone to refuse to repair something, uh, whether it's in or out of warranty. I'd, I'd just rather pay a little bit more money, especially on an expensive lens like this, and have that peace of mind. If it were a cheaper product, yeah, I might risk buying something for a grey market, but um, on something expensive like this, no, no, I, I, want, I want that warranty, I want that peace of mind. Um, right, let's pull out this, what we got, empty box now, you can see, um, two polystyrene things, which I'll pop to the side out of the way. Let's remove, let's remove the lens from the polystyrene. Um, carry case. This is lens case on the bottom, not sure if you can read that. And um, feels all right, yeah, feels okay. And the Sigma lens came with a case as well. Um, double zip. Padding on Velcro on the inside case. Um, a strap, I guess, for the case. Let's get the lens out. Anything else inside this box? No, that box is now, or that, that case rather, is now empty. Lens wrapped in bubble wrap. Kind of quite standard for Canon stuff. Let's remove that. And another seal. Or another bag, rather. Put that to one side. Right, so there we have it. Um, lens on the desk. Let's move this carry case one side I think get all this stuff out of the way right yeah um, lens hood is not on some padding inside the lens hood which um, I might keep actually in the box in case I ever sell this or uh, move it on I mean I'll if this doesn't hit the mark, then I will pass it on because it's a lot of money to hold on to and not use. Um, so I'm really hoping that it will it will perform. Right, let's get the lens hood out of the plastic packaging. Lens caps on there. Get that on there somehow. I always mess this up. I'm sure there's a knack to it. There we go. This, I think, is a little trapdoor for adjusting a circular polarizer or a variable ND filter if you have, a, have this screwed on the end. Uh, filter size is, oh, it's not stamped on there, actually. Maybe it's on the, yeah, 77 millimeters, it says, for the filter size. Um, it's got a, what do you call this? Tripod collar? Which I'm not sure I'm going to want actually. I'm going to remove this. It unscrews. Hopefully, it can come off. Mm, not sure. Well, it's clicked. I can't figure out how to undo this tripod collar. I don't want to force anything. 
Right, okay, I've finally worked out how to undo the tripod collar. Um, so unscrew this and it's on a spring. If you pull it out, you can slide it off and you can see here, there's a little bit of grease just in there that's been applied by manufacturer. And that tripod collar on its own, to be honest, it's quite weighty. Um, so I'll, I'll weigh this separately and pop the weight on on the side, but I don't think I'm going to need that. Right, um, this is the zoom ring, uh, the, yeah, zoom ring, I think you'd call it. And straight away, one of the benefits I can see with this is that the weight tends to stay backwards. So I like the Sigma where as you zoom out, all the weight's at the edge and it will, and it will push push your hand down and make it quite quite hard to hold a lens for a long period of time. This weight is a lot uh, further back. But anyway, I'll test it out in the field. Um, we've got a smooth and tight ring, which presumably adjusts the, yeah, that's the resistance on on the zoom ring. I'm gonna swing, swing it to tight. And um, to be honest, I mean, it is tighter, but it's not, it's not locked it. Which I would kind of want. So if it's fully tight, as I walk, yeah, I don't think that's going to creep as I walk, as long as it's on fully tight, um, which is one of my concerns, I guess. Um, switches here, so we've got um, uh, full range and then uh, three meters to infinity. Autofocus, manual focus switch, uh, stabilizer on or off, and then stabilizer mode, which I've yet to uh, work out what they do. Um, numbers printed for your focusing on the front here. Um, I'm tend to be honest with you, I'm going to use a um, neoprene protective cover like I've got on the Sigma um, fairly fairly soon afterwards. I assume I'm going to keep this lens. Um, and just to reiterate the technical specs, 100 to 500 millimeter zoom. A variable aperture um, starting at f4.5 where it lets in the most amount of light to f7.1 and I will pop on screen uh, the different focal ranges that the aperture changes at as well. Uh, what have we got here? Um, minimum focus distances, so fully wide 0.9 meters or 90 centimeters and full telephoto uh, 1.2 meters away. So that's um, 2.95 feet for fully wide or 3.94 feet for fully telephoto. Right, well, um, I think that's it really for, for this unboxing. Oh, one other thing that did come in the box, I've just noticed it, it must have slipped out or fallen out somewhere. Um, there are some instructions and paperwork as well, um, but you know, hey, who reads those? I don't know. They'll, they'll go back in the box so that should I ever move the lens on, it will have its original kind of instructions and paperwork in. Right, that's the unboxing done. So let's have a quick look at the uh, technical specifications uh, between the two lenses uh, side by side. Right, so with that done, uh, let's go outside into the, uh, into the real world or, or a real field and see how the two lenses compare side by side. Um, just so that we're clear, I will be using the same camera body for, uh, for all of the shots today, which will be my um, Canon R6 uh, Mark I, uh, which is currently um, adapted to this, uh, this Sigma lens. I'm back at Salisbury Plain for this field test. I thought it was the best place I could come where I might get a hovering bird of prey overhead where I might be able to swap out both lenses quite quickly. So I'm just going to kind of go and get myself set up. I've already had a chance opportunity to spot a Kestrel at distance and just for speed because this was in my bag already connected to the R6 I did get it out and uh, snap a quick shot at very very far distance just to identify what bird it was. So I wasn't sure it was actually a Kestrel or a Merlin that I'd seen um, and I'm not too good at identifying my Merlins. And the first thing that struck me is it's absolutely lightning fast in the focus. Um, but mind you, that's just one shot <laughs> and I could be lucky. Um, there are, however, a few other things that I would like to talk about for this lens compared to the Sigma, which I'm about to get out here. Let's get rid of that, that bag out of the way. OK, so the first thing is with the Sigma, obviously you've got a removable uh, tripod um, 
collar, if that's what you want to call it here. But on this collar, you can see I've attached some, some loops for a uh, camera strap for a, uh, it's actually a Peak Design quick release camera strap I use. In fact, I'll just get it out to, um, to show it to you now. There we go. And these are excellent, by the way, they are so handy. So when I'm walking around all day, I can quickly clip on this strap like that. There we go, and walk around all day. Um, nice and easy, nice and quick, very secure. I think these are rated to 20 kilograms uh, and they do have a wear indicator on them so that if um, if the string or the cord on them are beginning to go, um, you can see that and you can buy replacement uh, uh, bits of cord or connectors, whatever they're, whatever they're called. And you can also actually uh, buy the connectors and the cord as I've done with the binoculars individually here. So I've used my binocular strap rather than buy a, a dedicated Peak Design strap. I've just bought the um, the connectors. Great bit of kit. Anyway, um, getting back to the lenses, the Sigma has that, whereas the, I can't really see anywhere on this lens that does have that, which means I'm probably gonna have to suspend the lens from the camera, um, which I don't like doing because I think it puts quite a bit of weight on the mount. Now, that said, this is a lot lighter than the Sigma um, which is great, but I'm not really happy about having all that, that weight there like that. I would like to see a place on here where I could perhaps um, fit a camera strap to. Um, another thing that I think is a bit of a miss on this lens really, this, the Sigma doesn't have it either, is the fact that I think this tripod foot ideally should be an Arca Swiss mount built in, which it's not. Um, so. Not that I plan on using it on a tripod too much because of it's, it's lightness, but with the Sigma, as I'll have to do with this one as well, is buy an additional uh, tripod foot uh, to use. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, let's just compare the weight. Um, mm, it feel, they feel pretty even at the moment. Um, bear in mind that this, cam, this RF 100-500 now has a camera attached to it. There is a definite weight saving. Um, now, let's talk about the build quality itself. First impressions of this, and this really is first impressions, is um, it's all right. Um, it doesn't feel that much better built to me than the Sigma, it probably is. But in terms of the plastic you feel, if I'm honest with you, it probably feels pretty comparable in terms of its strength. Um, as I mentioned indoors, the first thing that strikes me is the weight of this lens is, is further towards the camera, which is exactly what you want, because the problem we've got with the Sigma is when you extend it, which I'll do now, do so now, all the weight pretty much is on the front end of this, um, this lens. And so when you're hand holding it and you're out far, you've got all the weight at the edge of your arms and it really wants to push your arms down and it really, really can tire you out. Um, whereas the Canon RF one is much better balanced, as well as being lighter, it's better balanced. And I think that's just gonna make it so much easier to, to handheld for, hand for longer. And I think it's gonna make it a lot easier to have steady shots as well. Um, and I dare say, I mean, we'll look at that later, but I dare say the image stabilization, uh, which I have turned on here, um, I can see, is likely to be better, but obviously that's to be confirmed. So um, those are my initial thoughts, really, um, of the two lenses. Um, one other, small point and it applies to pretty much all Canon super telephoto lenses is oh, for wildlife especially why, why do you make them in white it's not really the right color is it but I mean I am looking to get some neoprene covers assuming I'm going to be keeping this it will still be decided I'll get some neoprene covers like I've done with the Sigma various different companies make them and that will at least help um, address the uh, the uh, the bright the bright white lens that I'm swinging around um uh, one of the it's, I mean, both lenses are the same here, um, but I don't like it. Um, it's the fact that they're external zooming. Uh, I know this is a, a, officially a weather sealed lens. How well, I don't know, because I've never had an L lens before or a weather sealed lens before. Um, the Sigma one isn't. They both suffer from the same external zooming thing, which is, I'm worried that dust, if I'm out in the rain, water, moisture, or whatever, it's gonna get on this. And when I pop it back in, it's gonna get sucked in towards the lens and somehow in the lens or damage or ruin or interfere with the, with the glass optics and elements. Um, that hasn't happened yet with the Sigma, but I'm always worried about it. Um, 
And likewise, the Canon is also an external zooming lens. Um, I do know that, for example, um, Sony's, um, I think it's a 200-600, is an internal zooming lens. So when you zoom in, um, nothing extends out. It just feels a lot more, or it looks, sorry I say it feels, I haven't used the lens. Um, it looks a lot more robust, uh, and I'd probably trust that lens more in a, in a, in a, a wet or dusty environment, actually. Um, I mean, I could be completely wrong, and I could be giving the, both these lenses a hard time. Um, so we've got weather sealing officially on the Canon RF 100-500. This is not weather sealed as such, um, but what I do know is that on the mountain ring, I don't think you can make it out, but there is a weather sealing gasket here. Gasket, gasket, gasket. Um, so there is some weather sealing, certainly where the lens uh, meets the camera body, but whether or not um, there's any other weather sealing anywhere else on this Sigma lens, I don't know, it's not really advertised as a weather sealed lens. Um, there is a sport version of this, which is quite a bit more money, probably an extra four to 500 pounds, I think, uh, which is um, uh, advertised as a weather sealed lens. Um, and so if that's what you want, that might be something uh, worth looking into. I don't know whether this is being picked up on the microphone or not, but there are skylarks all around. And uh, <clears throat> one thing I've always struggled with is um, focusing on skylarks with the Sigma lens, unless they're right up in the air and they're kind of doing their hover. Um, but certainly when they're sort of in amongst the grass, I, I found it quite tricky. I, I do have one or two shots that I've managed, but it's not really been the, the easiest of birds for me to photograph thus far. So um, if I do get the chance to photograph a skylark or two in amongst the grass um, this afternoon, I'll do so. And I'll be able to give you my feedback on whether I think uh, this lens has, uh, has made a difference or not. Oh, one other thing I did want to mention about this particular lens compared to the Sigma. Um, the maximum aperture is uh, 7.1 when it's fully extended at 500 millimeters, which is uh, a third of a stop darker than the Sigma when, uh, when it's fully extended at 600 millimeters. Now, I'm less bothered about losing a third of a stop of light but I am more, much more bothered about losing 100 millimeters. If I'm honest, I would much rather this was a 100 to 600 millimeter lens, but you know, I know it's not. And uh, I think it's supposed to be the spiritual successor, if you want to call it that, to the, um, to the old 100 to 400 on the, um, on the old EF mount. So, you know, at least we're getting an extra 500 millimeter, sorry, an extra 100 millimeters versus that lens. But you know, if you're comparing it directly against the Sigma, you're losing 100 millimeters and certainly in a place like Salisbury Plain I'd argue that's quite important really um, when, you're, when you're dealing with such fast distances and of course that becomes even more important when you put a teleconverter on there because you know you're you're magnifying that 100 millimeters uh, accordingly so yeah definitely something to bear in mind but something else to bear in mind as well um, and I'm missing this already on the 100 to 500 millimeter the Sigma has the ability to lock itself with a lock switch on and off. There is no lock switch on on this. It's just a, um, a tight or a loose um, adjustment on the ring. But it has the ability to lock itself, first of all, at 600 millimeters. There we go. And then, although you can't see this because it's covered up with a neoprene, there are markers on here at um, 500, 400, 300, 200, 150, I think. Um, and at each part of the focal range, you can lock it. Um, a lot harder when I've got neoprene covers on, so you can't see what the focal range is, but but you can. There we go. I don't know what focus, oh, that's probably 500 millimeters, but that's, that's just locked in at 500 millimeters. You don't have the option on here to do that. Um, I'm at 500 millimeters now, and if I move this ring all the way over to the tight section, It's just, it's just not locked in. It's just not locked in at all. Um, no. It's just not locked in. So there's no, from what I can see, there's no locking mechanism, which I think is probably a bit of a shame, really. Um, but anyway, there you go. Um, just realised something, actually. Um, I've left the tripod collar on this. Um, 
which adds a bit of weight and I don't need to um, really so I'm going to take it off why not there we go got the hang of it now finally and that makes the lens ever so slightly uh, lighter still and uh, yeah um, yeah I could hand hold this for uh, for a lot longer than the Sigma definitely 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 um, much more balanced much nicer just to show about that extra 100 millimeters really I've just been playing a bit more with the lens whilst I have a cup of coffee because things are things are pretty quiet here I know it's a field test of a lens but um uh, or first impressions review if you like but uh you know, if, if some bad luck comes along I'm going to take it why not um image stabilization so it is infinitely better on this just pinning it against some trees in the background um when you hold the focus button down it just stays there it really does whereas with the signal what will happen is it'll it'll lock on the image stabilization is good don't get me wrong it's fine um, but after a while it will almost sort of it's almost like it runs out of breath releases itself and then will move around in the frame and you'll have to you'll have to um to refocus a, a, again so um, i do find that this is rock solid from a new stabilization point of view oh right well there's curly absolutely everywhere there's at least two behind me there's another three in the sky at the same time over there but they're really really high um the buzzard seems to be getting involved with them as well oh and they've all split but now's my chance come on Can you hear that? Right. Well, I sprayed and prayed on those curly. I've got three of them. Right, just, just flicking through this, these curly shots on the back of the camera. They are taken at a distance. Um, I don't know if you can see that as I zoom in, but um, I don't know how many pictures I took. I'm shooting a compressed raw. Um, I did run out of the buffer. I just sprayed and prayed. Um, I must have taken 400 shots of curlew. Just quickly spanning through all of these, they all look incredibly in focus and sharp to a much greater degree than I would normally expect to see from the Sigma. But obviously, you can't order it on the back of the... Uh, back of the um, camera screen but yeah they look really really tack sharp they really do um that's quite impressive again the killer didn't fly quite as close as i'd like but a good test for the lens that was a good first test i'm, I'm, I'm pleased with how it responded on that right well it could just be that i'm having a particularly lucky day but um do you remember i said earlier on that i sometimes struggle to to photograph curly uh, sorry, curly, Skylux. Um, I don't seem to be struggling today. Uh, not with the 100 to 500. Um, it. I mean, I just hit the um, uh, IAF button. I'm not getting IAF, but it will default to the, um, to the actual bird's body itself first. And um, even at a distance when it's small, it just picks it up quicker. It just locks on and it just tracks it all the way. Um, and when I um, zoom into 100%, um, it just looks like the majority of shots are sharp um not i mean it could just be i'm having a really lucky day that is quite possible but um i think i, I do think the lens is doing a, a better job than the sigma would the sigma tends to find tends to um tends to hunt a bit before it can actually find the bird once it finds the bird it generally keeps keeps focus um, and then will often pulse so a lot of your shots will be sharp not sharp sharp not sharp sharp not sharp but it will generally once it finds it keep the bird in focus um, the problem is getting it to focus in the first place or to lock on to that to that subject I can't kestrel in it's still there it doesn't know I'm here right. it's um it's just it's just moved a bit further away whoops I just moved a bit further away, perhaps too far for the photographs, but um, 
it leads me to another point which is quite useful to, to consider. I guess something that the Micro Four Third uses when I walk too well is that this this is a lot shorter. Well, not a lot shorter, shorter than the Sigma. Um, and as well as being lighter, it's just more portable, more manoeuvrable. And I think when you've got a big lens and you're swinging it around, you, it, it's quite noticeable, really. So I think having it a bit shorter, a bit lighter, more manoeuvrable means you can you can move around and get the shot a bit easier than you can do with the, the Sigma. Couple that, of course, with the faster focusing, that, uh, and I think this this does make it a bit of a bit of a game changer from a focusing perspective. Really, don't underestimate. Um, how important having a, a, a shorter lens and, and basically less of a footprint um, when, when you're out um, stalking wildlife makes because it's much less noticeable when you're swinging around a, a smaller lens as opposed to a bigger lens. And that will help you get closer. Right, we got a shot in our lens. Just have to, it's on the distance, it's on the distance. Coming over this way slowly, I think. Slowly working its way over towards me. Nice. It's got the eye, it's got the eye. Wow. See that? That's incredible. Get my voice down, but my god, these are awesome. Is there anything left? Is there? So the owl is, um, I can see it is still on the ground as well, on the edge of the grass. Um, I think I've done enough shots with the 100 to 500 today to get a sense of um, how it's doing. Um, what I'm now going to do is swap to the um, Sigma uh, and then see how that performs. I won't put a teleconverter on the Sigma, obviously, because I do want a back-to-back -back comparison. I tried to keep my voice down, so the owl's actually right behind me in that grass. If you see where the grass, the long grass meets the mowed grass, it's right on the edge. Um, I've now switched to the, uh, the Sigma and hopefully I'll be able to get some shots of the owl if he goes and flies around again around this way but uh, for now he's just sat on the ground looking around every now and again. Well, I might as well make a coffee. I don't think uh, he either doesn't know I'm here or he's not bothered. Hopefully he doesn't know I'm here with a bit of luck. Owl's off, he's off, he's off. He's off. Where is he? Where's he gone? Where's he gone? Where's he gone? There he is. Oh. Okay. Right. It's not. The short owl is now hunting. in the same area, there's every chance he might loop back round. So it's like using this lens. Oh, is it going round? No, well, I think he's flying off to the, uh, to the field. He might loop round. So, First thing I notice is um, this is just a fraction slower. 
to pick up the owl. Uh, it's more likely as well to lose the owl during tracking, but I will say, once locked on, it does a reasonably good job. Um, I noticed the extra 100 millimeters on this straight away. Straight away. I, I almost wish that those short owl shots that I took with the 100 to 500 were taken with this. However, had I done so, I probably wouldn't have as many keepers in there. In fact, I know I wouldn't from previous experience because of the because of the pulsing that this does. Giant house pack is just it's landed on a tree right behind me, and it's caught something from the tree. It's dived down to the ground, <laughs> spread its wings over it to shield whatever it's caught. It's looking around to see if. Uh, Anything's like to steal it, and it's still on the ground. I think it's eating on the ground. Um, I managed to get a couple of very distant shots of it. Um, still on the Sigma. Probably wouldn't have been able to get those distant shots with the 100 to the 500. To be fair, that extra 100 millimeters has made a difference. Let's see if I can record him. What a, what a day to get close-up shots like that of a shorted owl. It doesn't happen very often to me. Um, so great to christen it with a new lens. Um, quite interested to go back and compare the bursts of shots um, that I've taken with, perhaps with some previous bursts of shots from here, but with the Sigma, uh, perhaps last year. Um, not quite on the same day, unfortunately, but... Um, when a short arrow comes that close, there's no way in the world I'm going to stop taking pictures and change lenses. Absolutely no way in the world, I'm sorry, but no. Um, <laughs> you don't get that lucky twice, so uh, I'll take the shots while I, while I can get them. Um, yeah, so we'll go back home um, and uh, we'll compare on the computer um, how they all look. So we're back at the computer and I thought it'd be useful to try and compare how the short scale shots that we took with the 100 to 500 compare with short scale shots shot with the Sigma um, that were taken actually from the very, very same location um, in similar similar weather conditions uh, with, with some greyish sky, albeit the sun was, was setting. Um, difficult to replicate the exact conditions for wildlife, but uh, I think I've got as close as I can. So what we're going to do is just look, I think, at um, a burst of shots taken from the Sigma as a short owl approaches and just try and get a sense of how sharp these are. We will be looking at uh, raw files. Let's have a look at the, how the images compare. So we'll start at image 602 on the bottom here and we will work our way up to um, perhaps uh, image 632. We'll look around about 30 shots. Um, so we'll start off with this one here. So it's not a bad shot. Um, I wouldn't say it's as sharp as um, I'd like it to be um, and that's one of the issues perhaps with the Sigma lens is it pulses, um, it will uh, pulse in and out of focus but yeah, it's not too bad and you can certainly using the developed module make that sharper still but yeah overall not too bad um, I, I'd say it's got the eye there um, still, still a perfectly usable result uh, we'll now move on to the next one 603 I'd say it's all right. Again, it's not, it's not, it's not quite tack sharp. Maybe a little bit, slightly, slightly out of focus. But I've been very, very usable nevertheless. I would say, and again, that'll sharpen up fine. Uh, Six oh four. Okay, yeah, not too bad. I'd say perhaps a, a, a tad sharper than the others. Perhaps this one at six oh five here is getting a little bit, uh, a little bit softer. Six oh six. Yeah, I'd say it's starting to get a little bit more softer and out of focus. Um, On to 607. Yeah, again, starting to get even more softer and even more slightly out of focus. And again, that's the pulsing effect of the lens. Bear in mind, I'm shooting at 20 frames a second. 608, yeah, starting to get 
more out of focus still, I would say. So this one I would say is more in focus now. So it's almost like we're starting to get uh, back in towards focus. That's uh, number 609, 610. Mm, not quite as sharp as the last one, I'd say, but not far off, not far off at all. Or is it mm, tricky? Maybe they're on a par, perhaps. Uh, shot number 611. Mm, I'm going to say slightly less sharp than um, 610. Yeah, so we're starting to sort of slightly lose the, uh, the focus a little bit there, ever so slightly. Um, on to 612, losing focus, slightly less sharp. 613, perhaps 613 is actually starting to get sharper than 612. Let me have a look again. Yeah, I would say it is. It's starting to get sharper still. So I've skipped past uh, image 614 because that is one of my uh, finalized edited images. So it's not really, really a fair test. And I would say that is compared with 613, slightly sharper. So again, uh, the effect of the pulsing is causing this, I think. So bear in mind, we're shooting at 20 frames a second. It's focusing, then losing focus, then gaining focus, which is why we're, we're getting a bank of uh, shots that are starting to get progressively sharper and then unsharper, and then the process repeats itself. Assuming that we take out the edited pictures, we're probably looking at around about 25 pictures that we've just analysed, more or less. Um, and I'd say there's probably only um, a handful in there that I would say are are really on the, on the sharp side. Maybe maybe up to 10, I'd say, um, of the 25, having cycled through. Right, so we're now looking at shots taken with the RF 100 to 500 lens and first shot we looked at, my goodness me, what an absolute difference in terms of sharpness. Um, it is absolutely night and day. Let's move on to the next one. Again, absolutely tack sharp. Uh, and these two so far are absolutely a country mile sharper than any of the Sigma shots. Third shot here, um, it was just slightly out of focus, I'd say. It looks like it's probably just focused a tad under the wing, maybe. That could be down to the fact I've been using the wrong image stabiliser mode, potentially, but um, I'd still argue that perhaps this is um, as good as the majority of the um, Sigma shots that I've taken and, and could be um, could be sharpened up relatively easy. Next one, again, sharper than most of the Sigma shots, I would say, but not quite, not quite as tack sharp as the first two. Same situation again, not as sharp as the first two, but um, uh, on, on par with the majority of the Sigma shots. That is a sharp shot and uh, better than I think any of the Sigma shots that I've looked at so far. Not quite as sharp as the first two. Absolutely nice and sharp, way better than Sigma. And again, sharper than any of the Sigma shots, although not, not quite as sharp as um, on a par with the Sigma shots, I'd say. Better slightly than, than, than most of the Sigma shots, or in fact, I don't think they're the Sigma shot I would say that's better in terms of sharpness than this one. But it's not particularly sharp by RF 100 to 500 standards that we're analysing. Oh, that one is a very nice sharp picture. And again, a very nice sharp picture. And a very nice sharp picture of a sleepy looking owl. That is, again, way sharper than anything the Sigma's put out. And again, it's getting sharper still, but I mean, you wouldn't complain with earlier ones beforehand either. It's almost an identical shot to the one beforehand, but the moral of the story here is already I can see that we are getting way more keepers in terms of sharpness. So we've looked at around about 25 images in total, and I would suggest that um, the RF 100 to 500 is giving way more uh, sharper shots and is tracking the bird in flight overall. Uh, much better and much more accurately. Okay, so I have pulled the two sharpest shots that I can find from both lenses. So that's the sharpest shot from the Sigma and the sharpest shot from the 100 to 500. And I thought it'd be interesting to compare them side by side. Um, incidentally, I should just say they are both by chance have been shot with the same um, yeah. shutter speed, which is 1,250th of a second. Uh, just a flag with the RF lens. On the right here is shot at f7.1. The shot on the left, which is the Sigma, is shot at um, f6.3. 
ISO on this owl on the left with a sigma is 1600. And yes, it's a tad underexposed, unfortunately. The exposure on the owl on the right hand side, just by chance, it's double actually. Um, so you would think even twice the noise um, at 3200, although the exposure is, I'd say, pretty much bang on actually. Um, so, I mean, judge for yourself, I don't know if it's coming across on YouTube um, okay with the, with the video compression, but there is a noticeable difference in terms of sharpness. So the question is, uh, will you get sharper shots with the 100 to 500 lens? Yes, you will. Um, will you get more keepers with the 100 to 500 lens? Uh, yes, you will. The RF 100 to 500 wins um, outright. And to be honest with you, so it should do as well, given the cost of it compared with the Sigma. That is one thing to bear in mind, that the 100 to 500 is over three times the price of the Sigma lens. I still think the Sigma lens offers fantastic value overall. Right, well, if you've watched one of my previous videos before, you'll recognise this place. Um, I'm back at the uh, nature reserve that um, I visited previously. Um, I don't have a back garden because I live in a flat in the middle of town. Um, but realising that most people do, I thought it'd be a useful exercise to try and see how, how this compares in a um, shoot bird, new back garden type situation. So. Um, the best I could think of would be to come to a nature reserve, use their hide, um, and uh, just do some back-to-back -back tests. We'll look at how quickly um, focus is acquired, um, how sticky it is, um, and we'll also look at the teleconverter performance as well. So I'm going to take a few shots uh, with the 100 to 500 first and let you know how I get on. Right, so I've taken... Um, quite a few shots with the 100 to 500 um, of small birds on the ground um, on the feeders um, and, and the squirrel um, just having a quick pick through the back of the camera pretty much all of them look um, pretty pretty tack sharp to be fair um, and the lens is focusing uh, pretty fast so it's an impressive performance um, but anyway I'm running out of time so I'm now going to switch over to the Sigma and um, and see how it compares. Same settings as before. Uh, 640th of a second, f7.1, auto ISO. I'm neither overexposing nor underexposing. I'm dead center in the middle. Um, and uh, we'll see how it performs. Let's also start to use the Sigma. A couple of things that um, I'm noticing or aware of now straight away, having, having come from the RF uh, to 500. First of all, the focusing motor itself um, does make some noise. So if, if you happen to be filming with a Sigma, for example, and you haven't got an external mic attached, um, that focusing motor will be picked up by the camera and you will hear the clicking of the motor. Um, and I can hear it moving uh, as, as I focus around. It's not normally a bit of a problem in day-to-day -day use, to be honest with you. Okay, so um, I am finding that the Sigma is a little bit slower in focusing. Um, but the reality is, in, kind of like in the real world like now, it's because I'm looking for it. It's because I'm looking for it with this review. Um, if I wasn't looking for it, I probably wouldn't have noticed, to be honest with you. Um, just scanning the, uh, the back of the camera as well. Uh, looking at some of the shots that I've just rattled off with the Sigma. Um, the majority of them, to be honest with you, are pretty, are pretty sharp. Um, they, look, they look good on the back of the camera. Um, I'm getting, uh, I am getting more keepers with the RF 100 to 500 um, in terms of my first shot. Um, and I'd say that the shots that I'm getting are looking a, a little bit sharper overall, to be honest. Um, but, you know, the Sigma is pulling up a hell of a performance. It's not, um, it's not a bad performance at all whatsoever. Yes, I'm not going to talk too much throughout the um, pulsing in depth because there's a chap called um, Dwayne Patron. I think that's um, how you pronounce his name. And uh, Dwayne, if you're watching, apologies if I got that wrong. Um, he has done a really, really excellent um, video on what the pulsing effect is um, on a number of um, Canon uh, mirrorless bodies and how you can also perhaps um, dial some of that out and overcome it uh, using the um, Sigma. Uh, USB dock. I'll let, I'll let him 
cover off the pulsing effect, but yes, it is present on this lens. And that's one thing actually that I should mention. I do have the USB dock for Sigma. It's a little adapter where you can um, plug the Sigma lens into the uh, into your laptop or your PC, and number one, you can update the firmware, uh, which I've done. And there's also um, customization buttons, so you can customize what those customization buttons do in terms of uh, different types of image stabilization, and autofocus speed and accuracy. You can also calibrate the lens as well. I did customize the lens for autofocus speed, um, image stabilization, etc. And I also had uh, the lens calibrated at Sigma um, to my 77D DSLR because it's that particular DSLR doesn't have um, micro focusing in the menu system. So um, luckily, the Sigma lens does have that facility. And yes, you can customize that and do it yourself at home using the Sigma USB dock but Sigma offered a service where they would do it for you free of charge, provided that you sent the lens into them within the first two years of purchasing. So that's what I did. I sent it into Sigma, it did cost me a penny, and they calibrated the lens for my DSLR body. Um, so that's well worth doing if you were a DSLR shooter. Obviously, if you're not a DSLR shooter and you're shooting on mirrorless, there's no need to calibrate your lens because it doesn't go through an autofocus system um, through the viewfinder and then back onto the sensor. It's a, it's a direct sensor read. Right, it's a teleconverter time. Let's see how the two lenses perform with a 1.4 teleconverter. So first up, as it's already on the camera body, we have the Sigma, which I'm going to mount to a Canon uh, 1.4 teleconverter. You probably can't see that, but that is the Mark III version. Okay, so I've set the aperture to f10 on the Sigma with the 1.4 teleconverter because that is the aperture um, that you would get with the 100 to 500 given that it's a, an f7.1 lens. Um, on the Sigma otherwise, with a teleconverter, your maximum aperture would normally be f9. And again, we're keeping the um, focal length at 500 millimeters on the Sigma, so with 1.4 teleconverter, that makes it 700 millimeters. So exactly the same as um, the teleconverter on the RF um, for back-to-back -back testing. It's just a noticeable um, speed difference. Um, put the teleconverter on, it's noticeably much slower. Um, in fact, I'd go so far as to say I missed a few shots as a result of it being, being slower. Um, and on top of that, um, the shots are noticeably less sharp. There are a few still sharp on, in there, but um, I'm getting far fewer keepers as a result of the teleconverter. So, um, it's not something I would normally um, recommend using unless you absolutely have to uh, really on the wood with this Sigma, at least not the um, not the Canon extender. Uh, uh, how Sigma's one performs, I don't know. I mean, if, if you're someone that has used Sigma's extender on the Sigma lens, let me know. Do you think it's any better than the Canon one? Have you had any problems? Another thing to point out, although it's not part of this review technically, is that if you do put this Sigma on a crop sensor DSLR body, um, I can't speak to the R7 or any of the other mirrorless uh, bodies because I've not used them yet, um, but if you put it on a Canon DSLR, your focusing point will be limited to one single uh, focusing point in the center. And I can tell you from previous experience that the focusing speed gets even more slower. That's just due to the fact that obviously the crop sensor body is laying in less light, so the lens is having to um, to work much much harder to um, to find that focus that it needs. Or oh, another thing I should mention, which I think is important, um, my usual photography. Let's say birds of prey, um, owls, um, other wildlife species. I'm generally dealing with a subject that would be moving um, quite quickly at times but, um, at some speed either closer towards me or further away which means that the lens has to work a lot lot harder so for situations where you're pretty much static and you're, you're looking at the same uh, feeder or area it's a good halfway towards being focused anyway so that makes it um, relatively snappy still for for, bird and, uh, for I would say, garden bird photography, assuming it's a sort of a similar setup to this, you know, you maybe shooting from a conservatory or perhaps you know, pop a pie in your back garden or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's 
the Sigma's holding up absolutely fine, you know, even even with a teleconverter. But again, I think it's just to do with the fact that it hasn't got to go from extreme focuses, focusing distances from infinity perhaps to close range, then mid range, etc. We're, we're dealing with something pretty, pretty consistent. So yeah, just moving around a bit, snap, snap, focus, focus, piece of cake. It's, it's not having any problems at all with it. I am beginning to run out of light now, and I think I've taken enough pictures with the Sigma and the teleconverter to know that you know, for a garden bird type situation is absolutely fine and I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed in terms of the autofocus speed. Um, what I will tell you though from personal experience with the Sigma and the teleconverter, the, the, the birds of prey, um, it can be a bit frustrating sometimes um, when you're used to uh, the lens operating without one. Um, yeah, it, 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 it can be frustrating with the teleconverter in, in my experience anyway. Let's pop the teleconverter now on the 100 to 500 and see how we get on with that one. I can just hit the I button on a squirrel and it finds it straight away, locked on. Um, track's pretty good as well. Um, much less much less um, hunting from the lens, uh, both in terms of finding it and also in terms of staying on, on the subject. I mean, we're not dealing with subjects that are moving uh, too far out of frame here, so it's not like it's going to have to work too hard, but but yeah, I would say that you know, right from the get-go, there was a noticeable improvement in it, and it's night and day with the, the RF teleconverter. One of the things that I have heard uh, and seen on some of the reviews is that um, they claim that um, there's no loss of image quality when using the RF 1.4 extender or, or teleconverter. Um, gotta confess, um, I have experienced some loss of quality, I'd say. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm pushing it sometimes, and I've only had the extender a, 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 a day. Uh, I, I arrived yesterday, and I went out for short way down photography yesterday evening uh, with it, um, very, very low light, and um, I am noticing that um, I'm getting uh, slightly less sharp shots in low light with it. Um, in good light, maybe there isn't much of a loss in quality, but say for the photography that I do, yeah, there is there is a loss of quality. I wouldn't um, I would go out and buy one assuming that uh, there's no loss in quality at all. So I'm back at Salisbury Plain. I wanted to just sum up and uh, give you my final thoughts. Um, so either of these two lenses, I think, are fantastic and do and do a great job. I mean, I can't really tell you. Uh, whether to buy one lens or another because that's up to you your financial circumstances cyber photography that you do but i will nevertheless give you my thoughts so first of all if you are um someone who i would describe as and i certainly don't wish to cause offense but a fair weather photographer i mean someone who won't go out when it's raining for example um who maybe is primarily uh shooting from from hides whether that's static hides or or, or temporary hides um, but your equipment's always dry uh, someone who um perhaps uh, doesn't have to hike too far and someone who perhaps because you're shooting from a hide will get many 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 attempts uh, to rattle off loads of loads of shots on your subject to perhaps to overcome uh, the pulsing issue then I would just save yourself a ton of money and pick up the Sigma. Um, another advantage of that is because you will also get an extra 100 millimeters of reach and a third of a stop better aperture in terms of brightness for the lens at f6.3 and that's going to help you uh, get a slightly uh, more blurry out of focus background and separate your subject from the background just by the nature that you've got the extra 100 millimeters on here at f6.3 however um, if you are someone who perhaps can afford to spend a bit more money and um, you do go out in all weathers um, you perhaps do have to hike everywhere and wait's an issue um, you want something that will, will deal with the rain and, and, and what nature throws at you but crucially you also want some uh, something that uh, will help you get the shot when you only have a few split seconds to do so for example a place like Salisbury Plain where you can be waiting around for absolutely hours and nothing will happen and then when it does you've got seconds to quickly grab the shot you know I could have a deer come by or I don't, uh, I don't, uh, an owl coming through and then I've got to pick up the lens quickly focus grab the shots I might not see them again um, then that's when that's when you want the RF 100 to 500 because it is sharper, you will get more keepers and it will focus faster. Whichever one you buy, um, if you do, then I'm sure you'll be very happy with either. I mean, I've used the Sigma for two to three years now exclusively for wildlife photography and it's it's, it's, it's been absolutely fine for me. I've, I've had some fantastic shots as, you, as you've seen earlier. So it really depends on, on where you are with your photography and what you want to do. But yeah, the RF 100 to 500 is the better lens, but it's also more than three times the price. Um, 
there you go. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much for, for watching. I really do hope you found this video useful and insightful and hopefully has helped you uh, understand a bit more about the, uh, the pros and cons of both lenses. If you enjoyed it, liked it, learned something, again, please uh, give the video a thumbs up. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Uh, that's it from me, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.